Hello and welcome to The Flying Reporter. Earlier this week I was filming at the Light Aircraft Association at Turiston for a piece I'm doing on how the permit-to-fly airworthiness system compares to certified uh, aircraft uh, that I'm used to flying. And whilst there and interviewing the LAA's CEO, Steve Slater, I asked him some questions about the fact that they had recently been a victim of a serious fraud. Here's that part of the interview. What was it, £60,000 or so? 64000 Yeah, um, taken from, from, from your funds. What, what happened and what's going on with that? Well, it's a cautionary tale for everybody out there because we're not alone. And more to the point, we, individual viewers could easily be as much risk as we are. Um, the top and bottom of it was that a member of staff who had a signatory status uh, was contacted by the bank late one afternoon and was told there was a fraud against their account against our account and that they urgently needed to move funds out of our account to prevent a further fraud taking place. Now, when we're sitting here in the cold light of day now with the benefit of 100% hindsight, that sounds ridiculous. But these fraudsters are very plausible. They had um, password and account information. Their script was very, very clever in making that member of staff feel that they had a, a very experienced and uh, very trusted member of staff, I've got to say that this member of staff was led to believe that this was a legitimate bank call. They even were giving passwords and things like that. So they'd done a huge amount of research, as you would if you make £64,000 in an afternoon's work. The fraud went on for nearly three hours, just constant, and, and actually was passed from certain people within the bank to other people within the so-called bank. It was a very, very well-executed fraud. And... Our staff member, with the best of intentions and the worst of outcomes, transferred the money into two different bank accounts, or two separate bank accounts. Um, after about three hours, suspicions w came to light, and at that point the call was terminated. call made immediately to uh, our bank, NatWest, to close the account and to prevent this happening. But of course, by that time, they'd kept, kept this person on the line for sufficiently long that the money had been transferred out of the accounts they'd been transferred into very rapidly. Um, so that can happen to anybody out there. And I warn anyone now watching this, for heaven's sake, be aware, do one of the fraud uh, lectures or talks that are given by the banks online. It takes half an hour of your time and it's probably going to save you money. Coming back to the fraud, though, um, yes, it highlighted a, a hole in our safeguards and checks and balances and we have a very good safeguard and check and balance system but it hadn't um, taken account of the fact that a single person would then be put into a situation where they would be asked to transfer money between accounts and that is where the loophole was that was that was taken we obviously in fact within 24 hours had actually initiated new activities one of the other things we did was it took a little time to put the uh, committee together but we actually brought in an independent fraud committee headed by a judge who's also an LAA member in fact our LAA secretary um, and also another LAA member because you needed someone who knows how the organization works a long time LAA member who was the retired head of company's house and a third non-LAA member who was a senior, a senior financial operator for a number of major uh, companies and they did then a very thorough and full review of our processes, of the individuals involved, including myself. I, you know, it was a three-hour question and answer session for myself with our bookkeeper, who uh, was actually quite new to the job, and it wasn't uh, on, on their watch, really, that uh, this occurred. There were recommendations made, and again, on further checks and balances, on um, further systems that we've now put into place. And also one of the other things is, uh, a requirement that all our directors and all who are, gi are given governance training and also all of our staff have had to complete a, uh, a fraud um, a fraud training course. So, And any new member of staff joining us will also be required to do that. So we've done as much as we possibly can. And I do say that, unfortunately, we closed the door after the horse had bolted. But we've done our very best within here. And we've been absolutely transparent with members. We wrote to members once the review 
independent review panel had made its findings and we didn't uh, do it before them because we wanted them to their findings to be uh, made available. We then made our uh, findings available to members at the, the AGM and in our most recent issue of the magazine we've allocated two pages to the fraud, how it happened, what we've done since and uh, the actions that our, uh, um, that our management team have, have put together. Do you understand the anger of some of your members and do you take responsibility for the weaknesses that were in place in the systems here um, prior to this happening? Absolutely. Um, at the end of the day, it happened on my watch, and it, it, the systems we had in place hadn't changed for a, a number of years. Those systems had been around for a long time. So I don't think any one individual is particularly culpable here, and most importantly, the member of staff is not. We have a just culture. That member of staff is still here, and they, they're going to be the least likely people person to uh, succumb to a fraud in the future. As you can imagine, they've gone through a really terrible time themselves. Um, but yes, it's absolutely, it happened on my watch. Yes, I can understand the anger, but what I would say is the anger is only a small part of the anger I feel. Has your membership suffered as a result of this current problem? It's suffered principally because it's taken up many hours of my time and many hours of the board's time, where we should be out there promoting the LAA, promoting sport flying and promoting flying for fun. By having to spend so much time on this, it's taken me away from those core subjects. Rightly so, because it needed doing, but it has taken me away from it. It's taken our chairman away from it. It's taken the other board members away from it. Um, and what we've got to do is get back to being what we are, which is actually the best powered sport flying association, I think, in the world, and certainly in the UK. So people have left, have they, in, in response, direct response to the fraud and their, their distrust? I would say a very small number. Right. Um, there are those that have been very vocal on the social media uh, one or two of those actually may have gone some have said i would go but i need the permit because <coughs> actually i need to keep my permit aeroplane flight they could always go somewhere else with their permit mm -hmm. you know the caa will take them on but i'll tell you now that they'll cost you a lot more money i'm still focusing on the important things for the association one of the important things is that we do have robust governance and um, I, i'm supporting my chairman and the board and people forget that our board of directors I'm the only paid board member on the board of directors. Everyone from the chairman downwards here may claim some expenses, but even that's minimal. And the, they all are volunt unpaid volunteers. And some of the keyboard warriors don't seem to understand that. And what I would say is if you think you can do a better job, we can always take your expertise on board and have it on the board. But in the meantime, I'm 100% supportive of our board. You said that you take <clears throat> responsibility almost, the, you know, kind of buck stops with you, your CEO. Well, yeah, or yeah. captain of the ship. <laughs> did, 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 did you sort of consider stepping away um, because of it? I mean, it would be only natural to sort of perhaps feel that way, I would um, In fact, actually, I'd already initiated mm. um, my retirement plan because I'm 65 now, just turned 65. I'm on a long-term retirement to hand over. In fact, there is recruitment going on for my successor as we speak. Um, but what I would say there is, did I think, sh should I walk away immediately? And I thought no, because actually, A, it had gone, yes, it has gone terribly wrong. But the most important thing is we keep this association moving forward. And if I were to step away now, there'd be a vacuum, which would would take at least a couple of months, three months to fill. And I need to keep this association moving forward. I need to keep our staff motivated. It's been a body blow to our staff. Every one of our staff was shocked that something like this could happen to us. And, you know, whether it was the individual involved and the rest of the staff around them, they all feel pretty horrified that this, this has happened. Our board members have. I mean, our, our chairman even questioned whether he should stay in post. Um, and we said, well, yes, because... In every other respect, we're doing a brilliant job. We are, the, you know, without doubt, the, the best way for private owners to have affordable sport flying and flying for fun. And that's what we're all about.